Hello, and welcome to Third Thursday at Hoover's. I'm Jerry Flegel, President and CEO of the Hoover Presidential Foundation. Thank you for joining us this evening. We have a wonderful program for you tonight with a presenter who quite possibly has seen and heard it all when it comes to Herbert Hoover's photos, videos, and audio recordings. But before we begin, I'd like to remind you of a few upcoming programs for you to share with your friends and family. On Saturday, the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum opened a new special temporary exhibit called Exquisite Miniatures by Wes and Rachel Seacrest. These hand-painted miniatures uh, are greatly detailed and are really best viewed with a magnifying glass. And we'll have several there at the library for you, or you could bring your own. Um, and they're greatly detailed uh, on there. They, fe they feature 50 paintings and include landscape, portraits, still lifes, wildlife, and more. And it, it'll be on display through September 24th. And in each weekend in April, the Hoover Presidential uh, National, uh, the Hoover National Historic Site will provide programs at the blacksmith shop on Saturdays and Sundays. Learn how Herbert's father, Jesse Hoover, ran the forge and watch as the Smiths hammer out works of art on the anvil. Drop in any time for a free demonstration between 10 and noon and one and three this month. And then I'd also like to uh, encourage you to visit our website, hooverpresidentialfoundation.org, and uh, th where you can learn about a major fundraising campaign for the renovation of the Hoover Presidential Library and Museum exhibit space. It's been over 30 years since the last renovation, and we're excited about bringing new technology and other updates to the museum. We have a special benefit for Iowa taxpayers who contribute to the Timeless Values campaign, where you can earn an Iowa State tax credit, not a deduction, but an actual tax credit, equal to 25% of your gift of any size uh, for, towards the museum renovation campaign. There are still funds available from the state, but they won't last forever. So please contact us on how we can help reduce your Iowa tax bill and support the Hoover Presidential Library and Museum renovation. Because we pre-recorded tonight's program, we won't be taking questions live from the audience tonight, but you can still enter comments in the chat area and we will email responses back after the program. As I mentioned before, tonight's presenter knows a great deal about the recorded history of the Hoovers because she is the audiovisual archivist at the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum. With us is archivist Lynn Smith, and she's brought a collection of her favorite items images and recordings to share, along with the stories behind them. Good evening, Lynn, and welcome back to the program. Hi, Jerry. Thank you for having me back for a third Thursday program. I hope everybody enjoys the presentation today. I'll be showing you a mixed bag of photos and films that are personal favorites and a unique film set that may surprise you that we have in our collection. So I'll start with a few of my favorite photographs from the ridiculous to the sublime. The image on the left is dated from July 23rd, 1928, and shows Dorothy DeWall perched atop a very tall pole on the Ray, Roy Bradbury farm, helping to celebrate the Diamond Jubilee of Marshalltown, Iowa. The photo on the right is a doctored photo, likely from around 1908. To my knowledge, West Branch did not then, and does not now, have a cable car system. Here's another pair of ridic in the ridiculous category. The table scene on the left is a promotional display for the U.S. Food Administration in 1918, talking about the health benefits of corn and kind of further encouraging uh, their themes of Wheatless Wednesday, Meatless Monday, and so forth. And the photo on the right from 1945, I just adore President Truman bent over gathering snow to throw at somebody, probably a member of the media, maybe the guy taking the picture. And now let's look at a couple of my favorites and the more sublime and downright artistic. The portrait of Lou and her sons, Alan on the left and Herbert Jr. on the right, is one of a series of studio portraits taken in London in 1912. The image on the right shows Herbert Hoover's inaugural address on March 4th, 1929. I really like the vantage point of this image. It offers a behind the scenes view and a little bit of what Mr. Hoover saw 
as he gave his inaugural address that afternoon. The next pair of photos shows Mr. Hoover fishing near Brown's Camp, California in August of 1928. The water here has such an ethereal look, I love it. The water wheel behind it just finishes the photo and makes it almost like a fine artwork. The photo, especially the, the water wheel, reminds me of a section of Clear Creek in Colorado in Idaho Springs, complete with the water wheel. It's a very scenic spot, very popular uh, turnoff for photos. The photo on the right is Lou Hoover, a studio portrait from 1901. Now let's move from still photos to some motion pictures, home movies and newsreels. I have a trio of silent home movies to show you. This first film, MP93, shows Herbert and Lou Henry Hoover along with James P. Goodrich fishing in Florida in 1929. Goodrich, as you see here, was the governor of Indiana from 1917 to 1921. He was also a key figure in the American Relief Association that saved Russia from famine in the early 1920s. This particular fishing trip followed the goodwill trip to Central and South America that Mr. and Mrs. Hoover took after he won the 1928 presidential election. And the interesting thing about this particular film, it might not be so easy to spot, but after enough looking at films, I, I, I recognize the, uh, there's some vertical striping that you, can, you might be able to pick up on when you see the ocean there. It is, this particular film, while it looks black and white, is actually Coca-Cola. It's one of those that was uh, a black and white stock film that when shot through a project, uh, through a camera with a red, blue, green filter, and then developed and reprojected back through the filter that was taken off the camera and put on the projector would give you a, a full color effect. So uh, this is part of an upcoming preservation program that we'll be working on in the next uh, year or two to get all these other code of color films that we have uh, restored back to their original color. This next film in the trio set is MP237. It's likely taken from 1938 and shows Mr. and Mrs. Hoover visiting Yellowstone National Park, including the Old Faithful Geyser. And there's some waterfalls. I haven't quite been able to figure out which exactly which exact waterfalls there that are shown in this image in these films, but that's that's definitely Yellowstone some of the uh, thermal basin area in the center of the park near Yellowstone. Very nice scenery, just shot from the car as they drove by. And there's Old Faithful going off. And there's Lou and Mr. Hoover. The th last film of this set is MP187, taken in June of 1942. Here, the Hoover family and friends are preparing for a fishing trip. And after the, uh, of the gathering around, you can see next is all uh, views of the terrace from their Stanford home at 623 Marotta Drive and you can see the Hoover Tower in the distance. Unfortunately, I'm not sure who the people are and I don't know where they're going fishing, but they're definitely going somewhere. And here's the uh, home on Marotta Drive with the nice gardens in the 
cascading plants down the sides of the buildings. The, dis the, the home itself was designed by Lou Hoover with the assistance of uh, architects, professors from Stanford University. And currently the home is listed on the National Register of Historic Places and is the home to the president of Stanford University. I've never been inside, but from the images I've seen from the 20s when it was a new home, it was quite a remarkable structure. And there's the Hoover Tower of the Hoover Institution that was built in the late 30s, early 40s. Okay, and now we'll move on to some sound films. These are some newsreels. The first is, oh, this is the same one again. Oopsie, stop. There we go. Uh, the first film is a Fox Movie Tone newsreel uh, MP381 that shows Mr. Hoover's Armistice Day speech from 1929, where he talks a, a bit about uh, peace in the war, peace in general, and discusses quite a bit about a, a push that he was making with the nations of Europe to uh, disband, to decrease the amount of naval war ships and things like that. we have two paramount obligations. We owe to those who suffered and yet lived an obligation of national assistance, each according to his need. We owe it to the dead that we redeem our promise that their sacrifice would bring, would help bring peace to the world. The nation will discharge its obligations. The men who fought know the real meaning and the dreadfulness of war. No man came from that furnace to swash buckling militants. Those who saw its realities and its backwash in the sacrifice of women and children are not the men who glorify war. They are the men who pray for peace for their children. But they rightly demand that peace shall be had without the sacrifice of our independence or of those principles of justice without which civilization must fail. No American will arise today and say that we wish one gun or one armed man beyond that necessary for the defense of our people. To do so would create distrust in other nations and would also be an invitation to war. Proper defense requires military strength relative to that of other nations. We will reduce our naval strength in proportion to any other. And having said that, it remains for the others to say how low they will go. It cannot be too low for us. Now men of goodwill throughout the world are working earnestly and honestly to perfect the equipment and preparedness for peace. But there is something higher, something above and infinitely more powerful than the work of all ambassadors and ministers, something far more powerful than the treaty and the machinery of arbitration and of conciliation or judicial decision something more vital than even our covenants to abolish war, something more mighty in defense than armies and navies. That is to build the spirit of goodwill and friendliness, to create respect and confidence, to stimulate esteem amongst peoples. That is far the greatest guarantee of peace. It comes to those who are strong, but who use their strength not in arrogance or injustice. It is through these means that we establish the sincerity, the justice, and the dignity of a great people. That is a new vision of diplomacy that is dawning upon the world. It has been my cherished hope to organize positively the foreign relations of the United States on that, this high foundation, to do so in reality and not simply in diplomatic phrase. 
The establishment of that relationship is vastly more important than the mere settlement of details of any of our chronic international problems. In such pure air and in that alone, both sides with frankness and candor present their points of view and either find just formulas for settlement or alternatively agree to disagree until time itself finds a solution. It is a homely parallel, but equally true that relations between nations are much like relations between individuals. Questions which arise between friends are settled as the passing incidents of the day. The very same questions between men who distrust and suspect each other may lead to enmity and conflict. It was in this endeavor that I visited the presidents of the South American republics. That is why I welcomed the visit of the Prime Minister of Great Britain to the United States. For I have no fear that knowing our nation, we shall not be able to impress every country with the single-minded goodwill which lies in the American heart. The second film, MP436, is a few outtakes and then a finished newsreel featuring First Lady Lou Hoover meeting with national leaders of the Girl Scouts at Camp Rapidan back in September of 25th, 1931. Hugh Brace, a member of our own committee and also a member of the President's Unemployment and Relief Committee. This is the regular meeting of the executive board and the first one called for this fall after the vacation. And it's, particular, it's of particular interest because besides our regular work, we are most anxious to consult with Mrs. Hoover and find out the best ways that our national organization of Girl Scouts can help and cooperate in this economic situation. That's And it's, particular, it's of particular interest because besides our regular work, we are most anxious to consult with Mrs. Hoover and find out the best ways that our national organization of Girl Scouts can help and cooperate in this economic situation. In addition to newsreels, we have some unusual films in our collection. One of the quirkier films we have is MP39, a documentary about the Hoover Dam. Our copy of this silent 1935 film produced by the Department of Interior Bureau of Reclamation has French captions. Only the title screen is in English. As you can see, on the left is the title screen and on the right is a frame that roughly translates to the construction operations were preceded by long distance railroads and power lines that crossed the desert and ended at the site of the dike. And industry redoubled its efforts to meet the demands for materials. 
There are numerous copies of this particular film on the internet, complete with the English caption. But if you want to test your French, let me know. We can set you up with the digital copy of our French film. Would you believe that our film collection contains an episodes of the Mickey Mouse Club? Film MP4475 is the Mickey Mouse newsreel series, Youth Takes Over the Atom, that aired March 24 through 19, 24 through 27th of 1958. It was a four part series used within the Mickey Mouse Club television series. Louis Strauss, the head of the Atomic Energy Commission and longtime Hoover associate, is interviewed in all segments. Episode one is a general discussion about atomic power and its uses. Episode two covers the problems of handling nuclear materials, and we know all about that. Episode three concerns educational preparation for the atomic age. And the fourth episode discusses the future development of atomic energy, nuclear uh, flight. They have a section about you know, nuclear, nuclear powered aircraft, uh, nuclear medicine and interesting things like that. Unfortunately, uh, we have not yet digitized this film. So someday we'll get to that. Uh, occasionally, in addition to just working with films and photographs and handling reference questions, I do work with other things in our collection. Uh, recently, I was working to respond to a question that came in our email and when looking for documents that will answer the question, I come across other things that are kind of interesting. And I'll point out a couple of them right here. Some of them are downright funny. Uh, while looking through Mr. Hoover's papers, re 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 looking for information about a particular gift he received, I found that a person had sent Mr. Hoover some four leaf clovers with a note wishing him good luck in the 1932 presidential election. Uh, unfortunately, the Clovers didn't bring him any luck for the election, but the very fact that we still have them and they're still plant looking uh, is pretty good considering they're a 90 year old plant. Uh, another search recently brought me into Mrs. Hoover's papers looking through some news files, news, news clipping files for an event, what happened, what she did during this during whatever it was the event was. And I came across this newspaper front page from dated February 30th, 1932. Well, that's interesting because there is no 30, there's no February 30th. This satirical newspaper came out 55 years before The Onion, the, a more popular uh, present news, news clippings or news, news of today that's online. It was originally it came out in the uh, in the 1990s in print, but now it's strictly digital. In this particular uh, thing, you can see that Hoover demands a prohibition re repeal. Uh, later research after I found what I was looking for, I was like, this is an interesting thing. I want to know more. Uh, that I took under was uh, later research uncovered that this paper was a publicity stunt created by the Republican Citizens Committee Against Prohibition, led by a gentleman in Philadelphia. The papers were distributed on February 8th, 1932 at Grand Central and uh, Pennsylvania stations in New York City, along with some other high traffic areas, including uh, Wall Street. And at the same time, they were distributed in spots in Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. It kind of, you know, a little bit of a buzz, you know, that this newspaper created. It's, it's all imaginary. It says right across the top, all imaginary. But it made its point. It got some, some buzz in the media. They, there was an article about this newspaper that was appeared in the New York, New York Times, and that's where I found out about it. So... There's interesting things in our collection that's not just films and photographs and just kind of random finds that we all, all of our staff members come across in, in the process of our work. So that pretty much concludes what my remarks for today. Thank you for watching and I hope you have a good rest of your afternoon, evening, depending upon what time zone you're watching from or uh, when you watch it some other day online.
Well, thank you, Lynn. That's an uh, interesting presentation uh, on there. So, um, you know, one of the things that uh, I thought would be interesting is if people could uh, maybe understand with your background, uh, when you came to the Hoover Presidential Library Museum and, and maybe why you chose to come and, and so forth like that, I think uh, people might be interested. Okay, well, I started working here in, in November of 2000. I was originally hired to work with the textual records. I have a background with a bachelor's of uh, BA in history and uh, master's in history and archival sciences, uh, the BA in history from no University of Northern Colorado, the master's from Colorado State University, and a library and information sciences degree from the University of Denver. And you put all those together. I've always loved history. There was a position open after Dwight Miller retired back in, in 1999, and I put in for it and interviewed and interviewed again, and here I am. And it, initially I was hired for the textual records and over time, other retirements and other staff resignations, leaving for other jobs and whatnot, left me with the work to do with audiovisual. And I, I, I enjoy it. It's, it's fun to see and hear the different uh, imagery that we have, the newsreels to get a better background in what is happening in, of that day and what how that was expressed in not necessarily in the news media because newsreels were shown and uh weekly installments in at movie theaters there was in television back in the 20s and 30s that came later so it, it just been kind of a fun ride for me it was you know every day is maybe not an exciting exciting adventure but I do like what I do, and it, it's been fun to kind of explore and see some of these photos, like I showed, from the ridiculous to, sub, to the sublime. Uh -huh. So of, of the uh, audiovisual uh, uh, holdings that the uh, uh, Library Museum has, do you have an estimate maybe what percentage of uh, you have either laid eyes on or touched or, so, or looked at, so forth like that? Uh, I've seen probably two thirds of the films. I know they exist, they're well cataloged and described, so I know what all of them are about, but haven't really actually watched all of them. I've probably gotten my hands on the vast majority of our uh, thousands and thousands of photographs, just in some cases, just flipping through the box to get to the picture I need. It just sort of curious to see, you know, look through, everything's got a number, so to find number 80, you've got to flip through the first, 70 you know 79 of them so sometimes i'll have time to you know flip and actually look at each picture other times i just you know look for the folder you know it's number 80 is in a folder between 75 and 100 so i'll just look at that little unit so if, and um, one question i would ask is so if we have uh, uh somebody is interested in uh wondering about materials that uh, um you know photographs or videos or like that uh that uh, maybe at the Hoover Museum or of Herbert Hoover or like that, what should that person do if uh, on there? Should they contact you directly? Do they need to come to the library? Not necessarily. A library visit is always nice. We like to have researchers, but not necessarily. We, we're contacted a lot just through email. You know, I'm a person from wherever looking for Hoover doing food relief or fishing or whatever, whatever their topic is. And as you can see behind me, these yellow file cabinets are full of photo index cards, three by five cards with a small image of the photo with catalog information, the photo number, who's in the picture, what's going on, where is the take, where is it taken, when was it taken? And we can, and they're all ranged by subject. So if someone wants to know fishing or food relief, whatever it might be, or by date, you know, we know Hoover was, you know, in a particular city doing a campaign or doing something somewhere. We can check that and scan the photo cards so they have a general idea of what what they're looking, you know, what they're looking for. And sometimes I was like, I don't know if we have anything like that. And I pull up the cards and we've got, you know, two dozen images of, you know, Hoover speaking at a particular, you know, open opening of museum or maybe not museum but like a, a national park he did some dedication speeches of you know commemorative anniversaries of 
Revolutionary War. He did a lot of speeches in the Carolinas on the events of, you know, the 1790, you know, Washington's birthday was another good example. They celebrated the sesquicentennial of, or the bicentennial of Washington's birthday during Hoover's presidency. So he was a lot of places talking about uh, Washington. Uh, audio recordings, we have listings by date and number of you know where he was speaking you know as a campaign speech or this or that and i think probably 95 percent of our audio holdings have been digitized uh, that was a lot of the work of that was done by my co-worker and now uh, unfortunately passed away uh, jim detlefson he did the bulk of the auto recording digitization it was a process that took him a couple of years to you know, very carefully listen to all of these and put the pieces together. Sometimes it's a Hoover's campaign speeches ran 90 minutes at times, and each reel was only a, a 30 minute speech. So we had to take and record each piece and then string it together. So it's one long and so you don't have that cut in in between three times over. So Jim, Jim did a lot of work for us in, okay. in that well, regard. Could you maybe talk a little bit about because uh, you were involved? Uh, I call with the uh, I call the discovery and the uh, the viewing ultimate restoration and viewing of uh, the first uh, color home movies at the White House. Oh right, yes, that was our initial coat of color project. Those were films that, to to my eye and anybody else that looked at them, looked like black and white. But looking at the actual strip of film, you could see these lenticular lines, these lenses that would capture the color image if, if it was filmed through a filter and then the filter would be taken off the camera, put on a projector, and when it was reprojected, it developed and reprojected through that uh, filter, you would get a color image. And so several years ago, we put in for a, a grant from the National Film Preservation Foundation and they set us up with several thousand dollars to get seven of these films uh, restored into their original color. So we have digital copy of the color and a color, a color film print version of these films as well. And we've got somewhere between 30, 40 or more additional films. It was one of those, you know, now that you know what, uh, what I, now I know what to look for. I can see it like that, that initial film of the fishing, just looking at it, I can see, you know, maybe not everyone else, but I can see those lines in that kind of reflected, refracted lines in the film. And I'm like, that's a coat of color film. Uh -huh. And so that's one of dozens that will get uh, some grant money funding somehow to get those restored. It was a project that we had kind of started right before the pandemic and then everything came to a screeching halt so it's a matter of picking up my notes re-establishing connection with the uh film lab that did the work initially for us back in uh, 19 or 2016 17 somewhere thereabouts reconnecting with them and you know getting some prices and go from there Okay. Well, great. Well, I would tell anybody, uh, you know, uh, if you ever have any questions uh, about anything AV, uh, Lynn is the go-to person. And, and uh, I know I've had several requests where I've, I'm looking for something in a certain area or what about this? And and Lynn never disappoints uh, on there and she'll work tirelessly to try and help you on that. So uh, again, thank you so much for your time, Lynn. Uh, okay. Really appreciate your presentation. And, and uh, like I said, if anybody has any uh, 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 interest or, uh, you know, questions, uh, they can feel free to contact Lynn uh, at the uh, uh, Hoover Presidential Library Museum. Again, thank you for sharing your research and history of the Hoovers. Uh, and as a reminder, uh, this program will be placed on our website archive for you to enjoy and share anytime. Now, I would tell you, remember the Presidential Library Museum, as well as the historic site, is open seven days a week from 9 to 5 p.m. And please join us next month when Dr. James Calder of the University of Texas at Austin presents Hoover and Crime Justice Reform. Dr. Calder's articles and books have focused on security matters, political leaders, and crime control policies, uh, including the study of American presidents and their roles in directing federal actions against organized crime.
uh, on there. And I could I, I could tell you, I'll bet in that program there's going to be some discussion about Al Capone on that because that happened during uh, Herbert Hoover's time in the presidency. Remember to visit the exquisite miniatures exhibit now open through September 24th. These tiny paintings have been hand painted in such fine detail. You'll want to borrow a magnifying glass to get a good close up view of each one. And the Hoover Presidential Foundation staff is ready to assist you with your membership needs or charitable gifts in support of the Hoover campus and museum renovation. And you can learn more about this and even show your support at timelessvaluescampaign.org. And there is still time for gifts uh, to, apply, to qualify for the 25% Hoover State tax credit here in Iowa. On behalf of all of us here at the Hoover campus and the participating public libraries, we thank you for joining us and look forward to your next visit at the Hoover campus. Thanks and have a great day.